an allocation. An allocation is simply an amount of goods or services that is available. And point E represents an allocation of W and Z to A and B. So at point A, or I beg your pardon, at point E, individual A or consumer A has OAW1 amount of W measured on the vertical axis. Once we know that A is consuming OAW1 amount of W, we automatically know how much of W B is consuming. So move from W1 to the right to W2 on the vertical axis of consumer B. Because individual A or consumer A is consuming W1 amount of W, automatically we know that consumer B is consuming W2 amount of W. Similarly, since A has OAZ1 amount of Z, B has the rest of Z, an amount equivalent to OB Z2. So an Edgeworth box allows us to simultaneously figure out amounts. So now that we know how to interpret an edge box, we will use it to analyze a general equilibrium in production. Now suppose we have two goods, once again, X and Y, and these are produced in the economy using two factors of production, labor and capital. There's a fixed amount of labor and capital available. And whatever amounts of labor and capital are used in the production of X, the remainder amounts are used in the production of Y. So, if a certain, so since there's a fixed amount of labor, if a half of it is used in the production of X, the other half is used in the production of Y. If there is a certain amount of capital and one third of it is used in the production of X, then the remainder two thirds of it is used in the production of Y. And we can depict this in the Edgeworth box diagram as follows. So this is a diagram which is available in your book. So you should study it. And this is pretty much uh, the same diagram that we just studied, right? So notice there are two origins uh, for the two different products, OX, and OY, which are diametrically opposite. And the amount of capital used in the production of X is measured on the vertical axes, and the amount of labor used in the production of X is measured on the horizontal axis. And if you look at an allocation A, then that immediately tells us how much capital is used for X production and how much capital is used for Y production. Similarly, at point A, we are able to figure out the amount of labor used in the production of Y. And simultaneously, we know the amount of labor used in the production of X, an Edgeworth box. Now at this point, recall the definition of an isoquant. You should remember this from ECO 206. An isoquant shows the various amounts of labor and capital which can be combined to produce a fixed amount of a certain product, like X or Y. The diagram below shows an isoquant map. So if you look at the isoquant, let's look at the isoquant corresponding to output equal to 10. Right, so this is the lowest of the two isoquants that you see. Along the isoquant, the amount of output produced remains the same. So at point A, you're producing an output of Q is equal to 10. And at point B, you are also producing an output of Q is equal to 10. At any point on the isoquant, you are producing the same level of output. However, as you move along the isoquant, 
the combination of capital and labor used per period changes. So at point A, you're using KA amount of capital combined with LA amount of labor to produce an output of 10. If you move to point B, you're using KB amount of capital and IB amount of LB amount of labor to produce output equal to 10 again. So you know, remember on the isoquant, the output remains constant. The slope of the isoquant is called the rate of technical substitution, RTS. And it is the rate at which L can be substituted for K. Labor can be substituted for capital while keeping output constant. So as you move along the labor axis, the horizontal axis, as you move from left to right, the slope of the isoquant tells you at what rate you can substitute labor for capital. Because as you, as you move from LA to LB, you're lowering the usage of capital from KA to KB. What is the rate at which a unit of capital is substitute, can be replaced by a unit of labor? That is what the RTS is. Now, if you remember the Edgeworth box diagram that we just saw, in the diagram, we can add various production isoquants for X and Y. So look at this diagram carefully. Starting from the origin OX, we see various production isoquants for X, X1, X2, X3, and X4. Similarly, if you look at the origin of Y, OY, we have production isoquants for Y, namely Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. So as you move up the diagram from whichever origin, a higher isoquant represents a higher level of output. So at X2, you're producing more than you are producing at X1, and so on. Consider the point A, right? So I'm going to move back to the diagram. So consider the point A. At point A, what do we notice? An amount of X2 is being produced. An amount of Y2 is being produced. So keep that in mind. At point A, X2 amount of X is being produced and Y2 amount of Y is being produced. Let us move from point A to a point such as P2. So let's go back to the diagram. So move from point A to a point such as P2. What is going on at point P2? The amount of X2 produced has not changed, right? Because notice that point two remains on the isoquant X2. And remember, on an isoquant, the amounts produced remain unchanged. So the amount of X which is being produced remains unchanged at X2 at the point P2. Now, what about Y? Well, at point A, the amount of Y being produced was Y2. Or what is the amount of Y which is being produced at point P2? Notice that at point P2, we are on a higher isoquant for Y, namely Y3. So what's going on? As we move from point A to point P2, the amount of X being produced remains the same but the amount of Y which is produced has gone up, right? So the amount of X which is produced at point P2 remains at X2, but the amount of Y which is being produced at point P2 goes up from Y2 to Y3. So overall, without sacrificing any of the output of X, we have increased the output of 